without you guys coming out, these events don't happen, and we're super excited for this evening's guest. I uh, want to give a big thank you to the Plaza Bistro for hosting us, and Oscar and the whole team. It's been a wonderful event as always. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of new faces in the room. Who's here for first time for Startup Drive? Awesome. Thank you for coming out. So for those who it's uh, first time, and for the others, uh, indulge me for the, the spiel one more time. Uh, Startup Drive is based out of Silicon Valley. There's over 250 chapters around the world, and it's the world's largest entrepreneurial organization. We host monthly networking events with uh, great speakers like yourself. And uh, you might notice a little change in microphone and camera this day. So unfortunately, Rick Boland of Rick Boland Photography, who has been our longtime supporter and, uh, and big friend, uh, took a tumble yesterday. If you've ever been on a, on a bike with a clip-in oh. pedals, he couldn't unclip in time and came down and broke his patella. So uh, oh. he is not a happy camper these days. So if you want to make some food, bring it over to his house, perhaps a little bit of extra scotch, I'm sure he would appreciate it. But uh, so uh, we, we don't have Rick tonight, but we'll, we'll hopefully uh, uh, rely on technology and see how it goes. Uh, with no more stuff for me, I want to ask for a huge thank you and welcome for Rajat Mishra for making up on all of it in Burlingame. <laughs> really good, uh, and uh, before we get started, just kind of we're about to start winding down the year. So next month is October 19th. We're going to have Amy Miller, who is the co-founder and co-executive director, or creative, creative director rather, of Transcendence Theater Company. So I'm sure that's going to be an awesome chat, hearing her story about uh, how they do what they do. And uh, that's about it, so let's dive in. So what we wanted to do is have a chat with uh, Rajat at the start and saying, we've got such a, a diverse crew here. You know, there's some tech folks, there's some entrepreneurs, there's some folks that are retired and just coming out and want to listen. And so in order to have kind of our conversation tailored around what you all want to hear, uh, we'd love to hear some comments from uh, the attendees tonight uh, as far as what you'd like to hear Rajat speak on. Yeah. Fire away. Uh, well, I'm fascinated to hear anything you have to say. Um, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm definitely an entrepreneur. I've had a lot of different businesses currently. I own a clothing boutique. And I am, so therefore I have one foot in old school brick and mortar and one foot in this whole weird online shopping thing. Um, and, and, you know, I, and I know that um, the internet is definitely changing my business. It's changing a lot of our businesses. So, I, yeah, I'm just really anxious to hear uh, anything that you have to say about how, you know, not just my business, but a lot of businesses are changing because of online presence. So. so that's a good start. It takes all the pressure off. Basically, if you want to say, we're in on something. That's good. I'm interested in hearing some opinions and hearing anything that you want to particularly blockchain technology and the impact it will have on small businesses that are transacting business, whether it's locally or globally. And, you know. So for those that didn't hear, the question was around anything having to do with blockchain and Bitcoin technologies and how that's impacting small businesses. Any others? Yeah. Oh. The future of technology is always rosy, right? I want to hear what keeps you up at night. Not to devolve into politics, but given the current political situation, how it's impacting immigration, the visa applications, yep. how's that impacting the quality, the quantity of tech workforce in both Silicon Valley and Francisco specifically? Yeah. yeah. And so the questions around current uh, political regimes and how that intersects with uh, with the J with J1 or F1 visas and that stuff, or whatever. H or H1. So H1. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, and how that impacts talent acquisition and management for tech companies. Good. Uh, your philosophy is certainly growth, and what your plans are. What did you say in your Yeah. Yeah. I, that's my day job. <laughs> <laughs> if I can hear a question, what was the question? Yeah. What are the growth plans for Cisco systems? Your philosophy. <laughs> Yeah, Rajat, you were just talking briefly, and you mentioned the difference between small 
companies, startups, and big companies in terms of innovation. Give the talk some of that, just how you see that difference. The difference is cooperation. So with that, why don't we dive in and you, you know, can weave these in as yeah. we go along or just go off on, on tribes whenever applicable? Yeah, I'll try to weave them in and if I forget, just let me know and answer them directly. Perfect. Cool. So, for those that don't know you super well, if you could just share kind of a snapshot of your story. Yeah, um, so I was thinking about that on the two and a half hour drive from Birmingham. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I'll, 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 I'll 37, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I had a printout of her questions. And so if I think of my life, um, the word that I think really sums up my life is gratitude. Um, I, I grew up in a lower middle class family in India. And uh, growing up, my dad only had a scooter. And I, I think I told you this, my uh, mom would sit in the back. My brother, who's three years older than me, he would sit in the middle. And I would stand in front. And uh, we would be moving along the streets of Mumbai on that scooter. And only when I became tall enough that my dad could see, we, we, we bought a, a used car, right? So from there to uh, have a great loving family, my, my beautiful wife is here and my six-year-old son. So, uh, so just, just being here and uh, you know, having a chance to um, work in tech and work in strategy, which I love doing, helping small and large companies. And then being in Sonova, spending time this evening with you, I'm, I'm only grateful for how, how everything has turned out and uh, very hopeful for the future. So I'm, I'm an optimist about how I see the future unfolding and we'll talk about the political question. I think uh, I'm a few ways that. So uh, that, I think, word sums up my life. And um, um, if, if, I, if I look at my life, it, it feels it's a very linear, carefully planned story. So I graduated from uh, IIT in India, which is uh, a technical school, and I got recruited to Microsoft from undergrad. So I got to come to Redmond, and basically for the same programming I was doing in a lab in India, they offered to pay me money. So I said, that's, that's, that's a good deal. Uh, so I, I worked in, in, in Microsoft, and uh, after four years, uh, I did a lot of work on self-learning systems. So I used to fix bugs, and I figured, it feels dumb to be fixing bugs one at a time. Why don't we write software that can find bugs in the code by itself? And then that makes it easy to fix bugs. So I did that. That led to me starting my own team in Microsoft. After four years, I figured I should learn things about business. So I left Microsoft and went to uh, business school at Wharton. Yeah. And the only reason I went there because uh, you know the Reliance family in India is the most famous family in India, uh, the Ambani's and their kids went to Wharton. So I said, that's where, that's where I need to go. Uh, and uh, at Wharton, I got, uh, I got to work, I got an intern at Google in uh, Sheryl Sandberg's team. So Sheryl Sandberg was running online sales in Google. So went to her house, met her, met her wonderful husband. Uh, also interned at McKinsey, McKinsey and Company, the management consulting company, and uh, got to work with Michael Dell. And I really enjoyed that work. You basically solve problems for a living and someone pays you. So again, that's a very, I thought it was a kind of fun, fun, fun thing to do. So I did McKinsey for a while, and uh, five years into McKinsey, this thing called uh, uh, big data and machine learning was really growing. And I said, you know, that sounds cool. I want to understand what that is because that is going to change the world. So I quit my job, and uh, on the Fortune magazine, uh, I was in an airport, you are in lots of airports, when you do management consulting. I was in an airport and uh, the Fortune magazine had the 40 under 40 list. Uh, one of them, I think number 38, was a guy who had started uh, uh, an analytics and machine learning company. And I said, in, from, in six years, he went from zero to starting a company valued at $6 billion. Right? And he still kept 45% of the company, raised money from Sequoia Capital and General Atlantic. I said, I need to spend time with this guy. So I, uh, I, when I came back home, I got on LinkedIn, and I sent him a message saying, hey, I don't know you, you don't know me, but I want to work with you. And uh, he sent me a response an hour later saying, I'm going to be in Palo Alto in the next uh, week. Why don't we meet in the Sequoia offices? So I met him. I joined him. 
I quit my job, I joined him. And uh, I did that for a year, which is a great learning experience. We built, uh, we bi we built uh, lots of predictive algorithms, like for Apple, we built an algorithm that tells you when people will return their iPhones. For Caesars Casino, we built algorithms to find card counters. So what we would do is we would put cameras on blackjack tables. And if you look at hundreds and thousands of hands, the behavior of a card counter is different than a behavior from a normal player. Um, so we built those, that was fun. And then I got a call from Cisco that Cisco is going through a major change. This was when John Chambers had left after 20 years at Cisco. Chuck Robbins was coming on. They said this company is going to transform. Do you want a front row seat at leading part of this transformation? I said, you know, sounds like a cool opportunity. And that's what I did. And that's what I've been doing for the last two and a half years. So I lead a strategy and innovation for Cisco services, which is a fourth of Cisco's revenue, so 12 billion of the 48 billion in services. And uh, my job is organic growth, inorganic growth, which is um, acquisitions of startups, investments, Cisco has a billion dollar investment fund, partnerships with small and large companies. So that's kind of one half of my job. The other half of my job is innovation. So technology innovation like blockchain, machine learning, self-learning networks, how can we find growth using these technologies, and business innovation. We also run some incubation and some labs to create new ideas. So that's what I do. Um, and that's kind of my story. And, and if you think about it, it seems very planned, but uh, it really was not. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. There has been a lot of luck and uh, serendipity in my life. I just want to share one example. I don't think I, sh I, don't think I shared this with you when we spoke. Uh, remember I told you I left India to join Microsoft? Uh, you know how I learned about that opportunity? I, I'm an introvert. So I don't go to many events like this. I, I like I like the reading. Um, but one of my friends invited me for a lunch, and I said, you know, I hate going to lunches with large groups of people, but you know, I'll go. So I went there, and he told me, do you know Microsoft is interviewing, and they're going to select two kids from the college to go to Redmond. And so that's how I learned about the job. And the interview was in Mumbai, and they said for the interview they'll uh, host you in a five-star hotel one for one night. And uh, I had never stayed in a five-star hotel. <laughs> so I thought, wow, this is that's just for staying in the hotel. So I went there. Interview was in the morning, 9 a.m. I got there at 6 p.m. And um, the hotel had an elevator you know, with the glass door that goes up and down. I had never been in one of those. So I got there. And then this is, I'm being a little vulnerable here. But for 40, 45 minutes, I just went up and down. <laughs> In that, in that elevator, I was so amazed by it. So I, I went there, and um, I didn't realize I was eating up precious time I should use to prepare for probably one of the most important interviews of my life. But I, I went in, and um, then I went to the room, and I was amazed by, uh, there was a bathtub. And I had never seen a bathtub uh, before. So I called the reception and said, you know, how do you use it? So I learned how to use it. So then I spent another two hours in that bathtub. <laughs> and, and it was, and, and it got so late. So it was like 11, 11.30, I sleep early. I'm an early sleeper, it got really late. So I said, okay, I gotta prepare. So I said, I, can, I probably have only time, only I have time to prepare for one question. So I thought of what question it could be. So I, I thought of a programming question, you know, how do you reverse the linked list? And uh, I prepared that, I wrote it down. And uh, you won't believe me, uh, next day I had three interviews. All of them asked me only one question, how to reverse the linked list. <laughs> and I told them, look, you know, this question was asked by interview number one, but they said, you know, give me another way of solving the same problem. So it looks like it was very planned, but there has been a lot of serendipity and a lot of luck in my life. So gratitude and serendipity, I would say, are kind of two big themes in my life. Anyone else feeling a massive dose of underachievement? In the <laughs> <laughs> but it was curious, my big achievement in September was I programmed my garage door open. So we're, we're kind of on the same level as a lot of amazing So that's awesome. And I love what you're saying about manifesting. Uh, you know, it's interesting as you talk about, I mean, it sounds like this was grounded in you from a very early age. So anyone who's ever read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and kind of different ways of thinking about things, there's that whole, like you're saying, that linear progression of thinking about that one step in front of you. But it sounds like your approach from an early age, like you talked about, why don't we write software that finds the bugs and things of that nature, was much more on a, a macro jump level. And so 
where did that get instilled from you? Was that from parents? Was that from desire around people you were watching? Because that, that type of thinking rarely comes naturally to folks, and maybe it was for you. Um, so I, I, I've, I read this quote lately, probably, which will encapsulate how I think, right? Um, um, it says that losers have goals and winners have systems, right? So every January, many people set up goals to do in the year, goals to achieve in the year. 95% of people fail to achieve those goals. And the reason is not that they don't want to. It's if you force yourself to make so many choices every day, it is very hard to be disciplined every day. Winners have systems. And what does a system mean? A system means you take many decisions out of your life. You don't have to make them every day. But just doing those acts will get to where you want. And I've always believed that. There's a reason why Steve Jobs always wore the turtleneck and Zuckerberg always wears the hoodie. It's one less decision you have to make, right? And you want to save your decision making for the most important things, and they have a system, right? So I've always believed in system level thinking, and I have a core set, you know, three or four principles that I follow, and I don't even think about it. Like for example, um, uh, I wanted to lose weight, and instead of saying, these are the goals I'll have, I said I'll make a system, I, um, I won't eat breakfast, and I won't eat any sugar. And I just, I've programmed, my, and I, that's why I said no to the alcohol, right? Um, but now I just follow that system. So I get up, I have, uh, I drink a bottle of Pellegrino, uh, and on my drive to work, I drink another one, then I eat lunch, and I don't have to think about it now. So it's one less decision to make. So this system level thinking is what I really believe in. And if you, uh, Ray Dalio is one of my uh, um, uh, mentors, mm -hmm. uh, and I really look up to him. He's the founder of Bridgewater Associates one of the largest hedge funds in the world, and he talks about this also. The more you can get your life away from setting specific goals and set systems that you just follow, the higher your likelihood of being successful. And same thing for the programming question, fixing bugs one at a time and fixing, having these mini goals, a system would be something that'll go and find all these issues and solve them. So I've tried to spend a lot of my time thinking in terms of systems, systems for my work, systems for my life, and that is really helpful. And, and, and then how do you balance uh, the pleasure that comes from growth and success as a result of the systems with almost making things too formulaic at times? And, and where I'm getting at is like, where do you find passion and inspiration if the blinders are on to some degree of the time? And how do you, you manage those two? Yeah. So I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Just because you have a system doesn't mean, uh, doesn't mean you're a machine, right? So, um, and someone asked the question about large company and small company innovation, right? Um, right? Okay, so maybe I can hit that in the context of this, in the context of this answer. So when you're, a, uh, the, the big difference I see, and I've, um, so my wife runs a successful startup, um, and I work in a large company, I also invest in and buy a smaller company. So I've seen kind of, I've been lucky enough to see both sides. Um, in a large company, the cost of being wrong is very, very high relative to the upside of being right. In a startup, it's exactly the opposite, right? So if I think of my wife's business, six months old, mm -hmm. the cost of being wrong is this much, right? There's no cost of being wrong. But the upside of being right is very, very high. So in a, in a startup, you have to pick one idea and you have to focus. You cannot have multiple things you do because your resources are so constrained. But in a large company, I have to have multiple ideas. Because even if one fails, it doesn't matter much, but I need to have multiple because the organizational might, organizational inertia might, might stop some of them. And that's how I think, right? So going back to, hopefully that kind of helps in terms of one of the, one of the differences, right? But so if I think of my life, I try to have multiple torpedoes in the water at the same time, right? So I will get a certain amount of money every year and that'll keep increasing. But we have a hyper growth stock in my wife's startup. Right? And then given where the macro environment is, I am putting a lot of my investments in gold. Right? So I'm kind of hedging that. So I think of the portfolio of life, and then I have multiple bets going on at the same time. And um, I think I'm pretty good at killing things very quickly. So if things don't work, I have no emotional attachment to them. I would launch many at the same time. Sometimes that my wife finds them crazy. She's like, you know, we only have 24 hours in the day. How many of these things you're launching? And we've had many, we've had many failed ideas. Also, I had this idea of starting a company in Ireland uh, that could help us with some trading. That turned out to be a debacle. 
I think we lost some money with it, but uh, I think success comes from having these multiple torpedoes, knowing which one is not working, cutting them out early, and ones that work, you nurture them, you double down on them, right? Uh, Jay knows this, I play cards, so uh, I like playing poker. Um, my job also is poker at just another level. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the thing about doing well in poker is being tight aggressive, as many of you people who play cards know. So when you think you have a good hand, you got to double down, triple down on it. And when you have a loser, you got to stop it. So that's how the system, you know, you can create, you can create a system where there is enough chance for innovation and serendipity. And um, you know, if you can engineer serendipity, then you hit the goal line. And, and I'm, I'm really struck by I think a lot of us want to have that, and then we get caught up in the busyness and the to-dos of things, and wake up and just dive right into the to-do list. And I've got to assume, in order to have these levels of better vantage point that you're achieving with these and the results that come with it, you've got to be very disciplined and deliberate about hitting pause, coming up above deck, and spending time to be deliberate about your strategy. And so how do you bake that into your life where you see maybe other people aren't as successful with it? So I think Churchill said that life is one damn thing after another, <laughs> right? Uh, and it's very easy to get trapped in that, right? Just the, the daily one one thing after you, you're just doing them. And uh, one of my heroes, apart from uh, Ray Dalio, is is Dumbledore, right? from, from, from Harry Potter. And, and I think and Dumbledore told Harry in the first Harry Potter that it is not our um, abilities, but it is our choices that make us who we are in life. So uh, I believe that, and that's actually backed by data. So uh, one of the most expensive charts that McKinsey and Company has made, they did an analysis of uh, the top 1,000 Fortune 1,000 companies over the last 100 years. And they divided all the investments into two categories. They call the first category where to play. Now where to play means where you spend your time. Uh, and the other category is how to play, which is how you get better at it. So I'll give you an example. So if you take Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola's decision to enter uh, water, vitamin water, coconuts, coconut drinks, those are all the where to play decisions. Where should I spend my time? Uh, all the work Coca-Cola does on improving the efficiency of their bottling plants, right? improving um, uh, HR, like all the things they're doing now, getting better at what they're doing now, is how to play. Does that, does that make sense? Does the difference make sense? Right? Now, after all this work, after looking at thousands of companies over 100, over 100 years, um, McKinsey, the question they wanted to ask, how important is where to play versus how to play? Any, any guesses? Which one is more important than by how much? How to play. Sorry? How? Which is more important? How? How to play. Okay, uh, by how much? Uh, I think, I think by most. By, yeah, no, by, by double? Think by most. By most, okay. Any other opinions? Where. Where to play, okay. Why, why, how much? Three times. Three times, okay. So, um, the answer is, if you want growth, uh, where to play is 4x more important than how to play. So not 4% or 40%, 400%. So if you want to grow, choosing where you will spend your time is 400. Just, just think about it for a second. Right? So for example, anyone who created a, a real estate company in Dubai, when there was a boom in real estate in Dubai, or in Hawaii, I think Hawaii went through a real estate boom. If you were even an average real estate developer there, you would make money. Even if you're the best semiconductor company, you're not going to make money because it is 1% to 2% margin. So the choice of where you play is 400% more important than the choice of how to play if you want to go for growth. If you don't want to go for growth and you want to minimize loss, then how to play is more important. So if you want to go after growth, so going back to your question, Jay, so given Dumbledore said choices are important, and given all this data and analysis that McKinsey has done, I fundamentally feel that where to play is 4x more important. And if we just think of our lives, right, if you all believe this to be true, if we think of our lives, how much time do we spend on learning new things? Which would mean where to play, learning a new skill, right? Learning about blockchain, right? Learning about analytics. That is all the where to play. Versus how much time do we spend 
doing our day-to-day -day operational tasks that make us better how to play, right? I would posit that we spend 95% of our time in the how to play bucket, just getting incrementally better what we're doing. But all the facts say 400% better if you spend your time on where to play, right? This boggles my mind. And, uh, and it's, it's very hard because you get caught up in the one damn thing after another. So given Dumbledore's advice and the facts, I spend a lot of my time, Jay, thinking where should I spend my energy, right? Because I know that decision is so much more important than how well I do on that time, right? So time is probably my most precious asset I have right now. So that's the decision you make as a family, where should we focus? And we made a bet three and a half years ago that data analytics, machine learning is where we should spend our time. My wife used to run the, the data science team at Genentech, biotech company, so she's the smarter one in the family. And, um, and I ran the West Coast for this unicorn in data analytics. So that's how I think of it. So I am convinced, and hopefully I give you something to think about. Think of your life, how much time you're spending on where to play and how to play. And the facts say if you're not spending enough time on where to play, you should. Anyone else reevaluating all their life to see the same amount of regret and shame that I am right now? <laughs> hey, going back to systems and how you structure your life, I'd love to hear, uh, it's probably a good time to go into your, your three to four rules, if, the, if that would work for you. The rules, yeah. So, um, so my wife and I, we asked ourselves a question about three, four years ago. Um, if I could interrupt you before yes, you please. dive into this, it, you know, I think one of the huge takeaways around so much of how he structures his life and business is how to be strategic. And so I, I love that nothing seems to be super reactive or accidental even though you know these it, may, it might not be as linear as you play and sometimes magic shows up along the way uh but I, it sounds like it's a large part of your structure so i just love that you guys sat down and actually had this this conversation which i think is so rare so sorry yeah no so my wife and i we um well, when, when our son was born actually it's one of those moments we reflect on our life and we said you know when we are old um how will we know we have lived the life we wanted to live and uh, I must tell you, it was a very sobering question. You know, I used to drink back then, and we, yeah. we, 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 uh, we had a few drinks, and we were like, oh shit, right? We don't, we don't, we don't know, we don't know. And um, we started thinking a lot about this question, and uh, doing a lot of reading, talking to a lot of friends, and uh, we, we said we need to have a way, otherwise, like they say, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And we wanted to be more deliberate with where we are, where we are headed. So um, after a lot of thinking, we said we should agree on a set of values for our family. And these values would be beacons that would guide our small decisions and our big decisions. So not just my values, but not just hers, but values for our family. Um, my six-year-old also is intimately aware of what these values are. So, so we set up, um, we decided on three values as a family, and I can share them with you. Um, the first one is kindness, which is, uh, help others without expecting anything in return. Uh, I'm, I'm a Hindu and that's just a Hindu belief and I think many religions have it. And uh, it will come back to you. Even if it doesn't come back to you, the world will be a better place. So that's kind of value number one, kindness. Uh, value number two is courage. Courage is do the right thing even if your knees, even if your knees are knocking and you're not sure and you're scared. And uh, many of the jumps we made, you know, like I was the first person to leave McKinsey and join this startup. And uh, all of the senior partners told me, are you crazy, right? You're leaving a pretty lucrative and respected job to go and do this. But we felt it's the right thing to do and uh, it, it was about courage. Uh, and then finally, uh, the third value is learning. Because the world is changing much faster and it's changing at an accelerated pace. So I read a book a week. Uh, I try, some weeks I binge, I try to do two or three. But I love reading and uh, thinking about how things evolve. So, Kindness, courage, learning are our three values. And it, it makes things easy. Uh, by the way, my son, a few years ago, he added a value to our three values. He, uh, you know, one day we were playing, uh, we play cricket in our backyard. So, you know, it's like baseball, but the ball bounces. Um, so we play cricket in the backyard, and he said, Dad, we should add fun as a value to our family. And I'm not a very fun person, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a more serious, serious person. Uh, but we added fun as, as a value, and my son is six, now my daughter is two, and uh, these values have really guided us. So if you're in the mall and in a food court, you're sitting and someone wants to grab a seat, someone who's elderly, it's pretty easy to say, I should stand up, let her sit, because kindness says it's the right thing to do, and 
the cost for me is low and the benefit for her is very high. So that, that has really helped us. And uh, I don't know if this is the right way to do it, but at least it is a way to do it. And uh, we keep tweaking this kind of as we, as we go along. So kindness, courage, learning, and, uh, and fun. On the kindness front, uh, old school business philosophy would probably say the opposite around something like that. You know, some <laughs> BS around nice guys finish last or whatever that might be. And, and so tell me, uh, you've got some interesting insights on kindness and how that actually plays out not surprisingly from a data-driven perspective, so. Yeah, I, th I think there is a notion, right? I think uh, I think in business we romanticize the idea of war and competition, right? Every business school graduate carries Sun Tzu's Art of War in, in, their, in their back pocket. Uh, but my point, uh, there is Adam Grant, who's the youngest professor in Wharton. He wrote a book called Give and Take. And I'm not sure if you read it. If you haven't read it, it's not just a book, it's a life philosophy. So he's dividing people into three categories givers, takers, and matchers. So givers are people who spend more time helping others, right? Uh, call it a proxy for kindness. Takers are people who, as the word says, just want to take, right? And, and matchers are like accountants in life, life accountants. They will help you one unit, but they will take one unit from you. Now, um, he asks the question, uh, and he has a lot of data to back it up, which is what I like about it. He says, if you think of the top 5% most successful people in the world, are they givers, takers, or matchers? What do you guys think? Givers. Yeah. Givers. Why? Why? Because they are aware that it's part of the process. It's, and it's a karmic, it's a what goes around comes around. What goes, okay. Givers because what goes around comes around. Any other opinion? Matchers. Sorry? Match. Matchers. Why is that, miss? Balance, life is about balance and, okay, any other opinions? Yes? So I think they're takers and takers. Takers and givers, okay, so you had something? I was going to say the same thing, people are motivated by their own self-interest. Yeah, okay. Uh, so what he found in the research is, you know, the 80, 90%, there are lots of takers, but if you think of the top 5% of the most successful people, it is the givers. Right? It's the givers because uh, people help them in the long run. But I think that is a less interesting question. The more interesting question is who are the bottom 5% of successful people in the world? What do you guys think? Takers. Takers. My son's saying takers. Okay, any other, any other opinions? Givers. Givers, why is that? Because they don't take care of themselves. They don't take care of themselves, right? So, uh, you're right, right? It is givers. And it's givers because they give so much they don't take care of themselves and don't replenish themselves. Again, so to me, this is a very, very interesting insight. That kindness can put you in the top 5% of successful people. It can also put you in the bottom 5% of successful people. Right, so I call the bottom 5% of kind people the, the suckers, right, the kind suckers, right? And, and so, so the question it raises is how can you be kind and be in the top 5%. So that is something I have spent a lot of time thinking about because I, I don't want to change my values, but I want to win, right? So it's, I don't think there is, you don't need to make a choice between being kind and, and winning. And uh, what Adam Grant's research finds out, and I have a few kind of thumb rules myself, so first it can be done, right? The reason why the sucker kind people are in that quadrant, like sir, you correctly said, they don't replenish themselves. They give so much, they don't replenish themselves. So he says, to, to keep other people's interests high. At the same time, keep your own interests high. Only when you do both, you will be in the top 5%. And I have two techniques I use, and I'm sure there are many others, and I'm gonna spend my life thinking about how can I be in the top 5% of kind people. The first rule that I, I use is, uh, I call it generous tit for tat. What that means is, everyone knows what tit for tat is, right? An eye for an eye. But if you look at game theory, imagine there are two gas pumps, and one person on two sides of the road, one person lowers his price, and the other person replies tit for tat, lowers another price. Prices will just keep going down till they hit marginal cost, and no one's gonna make money. So tit for tat, uh, there's enough research that shows, is destroys economic value. But if you don't go for eye for an eye, someone will think you're weak, and they will keep abusing you. So what do you do? 
generous tit for tat. That's kind of my philosophy. And what I, it what basically means one in three times, let it slide. So if someone kicks you or abuses you, one in three times, let it slide. Maybe they didn't know, and maybe they changed their behavior. Right? So give them a chance, show kindness. Maybe they'll increase their price if you don't lower your price. But two in three times, hit back. Right? So, so, so they know that just because you're kind, kind of doesn't mean, doesn't mean you're weak. So that's kind of one thing, and I follow generous tip for that. And uh, um, I actually keep score. Right? I actually keep score. Uh, because there are, and especially in corporate America, right, there are many takers out there who masquerade as givers. I mean, if you if you've heard about the Enron scandal, the guy who read and uh, led Enron, he looked like a giver, but he was a massive taker, right? Which brings me to rule number two: is to diminish. If I realize someone is a taker, I diminish my interactions with that person. So if they send me an email, I will not respond immediately. Right? I will wait and uh, re respond slowly or not respond at all, or much, much later. So that's what I follow. So I think one can win with kindness. I strongly believe that. It just, you know, you gotta figure out how you keep your interest and the other person's interest both together. Because if you diminish your interest and keep other person's interest, you're selfless, but you're gonna be a sucker, right? How do you do both? And that's a hard balance, but I think that's a pursuit worth fighting for. I love a lot of the, the, the systems and structures and thought theories that you have for yourself. How do you reevaluate or renegotiate with them to see, you know, hey, I, I'm totally with you that having some structures is 99% you know, of the time better than none. But how do you do the fine tuning to tweak structures where you realize, hey, maybe I was a little off on that one or this one's not working out? How do you check in with yourself? Yeah. Um, so, first is um, I am very, very lucky to be married to a woman who is much, much better than I am. Right, and uh, no, but really, I mean, she was, we met in business school, and uh, she, uh, I don't embarrass, she told me don't embarrass me, but uh, by the age of two, she knew tables till 20. Right, and uh, at Wharton, she was in the top, top of our class, she helped me with many of the cases. We were both at McKinsey, where she was in the partner track, she left because we, we had our son. Uh, but that's kind of first, is to surround yourself with people who you trust, who can tell you when what you're saying is, is bullshit. Right? Uh, so, you, you know, so she, many times she, she tells me, hey, you know, this is not making any sense. And um, I listen to her, you know, grudgingly, and then I, I change, change my opinion. So I think, I think that's that. I have uh, friends I connect with who are not, who don't directly work with me. So I try to find the smartest people I can find. So I think I told you this, um, one of my friends is a high stakes poker player. So uh, like we bet, you know, Four dollars, eight dollars. He bets houses, and he bets cars, and he raises houses. Right. So he play. He's played in the multi-million-dollar games in Macau. So when I need to talk about, hey, I cannot read the room, and you know, I, I call him. Another friend of mine is a chess grandmaster. So he's the highest-rated chess player in California. So uh, and my son and I we just started getting into chess. But again, he has a different point of view, so you can reach out. So I think the trick is to have people who you can reach out to and. Uh, I have thousands of great people I can reach out to through all the books I read, so it helps you. Uh, that's kind of one part of it, so have ecosystem of people who you can reach out to, who you trust, and who you've given permission. I think that's really important. Unless you give people permission that hey, I will listen to what you have to say, they're speaking to a wall, right? Uh, and, and the second is you know not having much of an ego, because I, I want to win more than I want my ego to be stroked. And I, and I know that no one has all the answers. Like learning is one of my values, right? And uh, my son and I, we have the saying that when you win, you celebrate, when you lose, you learn, right? And, uh, right, I mean, right? And so, so, so that's what, so, so if, if learning is a value, it's not hard to realize that, hey, I'm wrong. Because it's, it's not about my ego or me being wrong, it's me learning and getting better over time, right? So those are the two ways. And, and I, I'm fascinated, you know, I, I, I wish uh, we had uh, technology or AI there to a point where we could like learn what it's like to be in your head for a day because the, the, the quality of your internal dialogue is, is really impressive. I love what you do on a macro level with the gratitude and, and having that practice. If we look at the entrepreneurial journey inside, it can be pretty, you know, up and down and not always the healthiest place to be. 
uh, if I can put you on the spot, you seem like a, a humble guy, but how do you check in and celebrate and really honor yourself each day as you go through this very, you know, uh, cataclysmic growth process that you've been enjoying and make sure that you're owning and integrating these new levels that you keep bringing yourself to? Yeah, so I I'm really forgiving to uh, on myself, right? And I, 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 I genuinely feel every problem can be solved. I genuinely, I genuinely feel that. So, um, so, you know, my wife and I have this theory of how do you want to live your life, right? If you think of a, a, a curve, you can want to live your life like this, which is high levels of happiness, low levels of, uh, like high levels of sadness, right? It's a high, a high beta curve. That's one way to live your life. Um, another way to live your life is to say, look, I don't, I cannot deal with these swings, right? So give me the small curve, right? I want little happiness, but when I go down, I don't go down too much. I, I'll go down a little bit. And obviously the ideal is you want the highs and you don't want the lows, but you know, life, life, doesn't, life doesn't work that way. And I am very, very, very okay with the big swings in my life, right? Like Job said you want to make a dent in the universe, so I want to make a small dent in the universe, and I know that means there will be times when I'll be very, very happy, and there'll be times when I'll be very, very sad, and there have been times when I've made enormous blunders, uh, but the optimism kind of keeps me going, so I, I have accepted my life is going to be this. Um, my wife and I, when we got married, she wanted this. Um, uh, I think we are going for this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you think back uh, to your days on that scooter and yeah. what your dreams were at that point in time, have you already, uh, for lack of the correct term, you know, driven through those dreams? And, and if so, how have they readjusted as you've come to new plateaus? Um, you know, when I was a kid, there was this, there was this ad on um, Indian TV uh, called uh, about a, a, a brand of men's uh, clothes called Raymond. And uh, the ad campaign was about the complete man. And it showed this guy who was successful at work, he had a loving family, he had other things he would do, and they would show different clips about this person every time. And I was very young, I was probably like six, seven years old, but that image really, uh, resonated with me and I've always tried to think of how can you get balance in life and um, if I think of you know if someone had told me when I was on the scooter that I'll be sitting here talking to all you fine people right, with Sonoma wine and, and, and snacks you know, I have exceeded exceeded what I, I have exceeded what I could have imagined you know, my wild, I've exceeded my wildest expectations right uh, I like to live life in chapters Right, so next two to three year chapters. So uh, clearly that balance is important to me, but there are more high highs and there are more low lows to experience. And I'm looking forward to that journey. What haven't I asked you that you want to talk about? Let, let's hit some of the questions and we can get specific, right? Yes. Do you only read self-help books or books you know, from mentors, I guess, what do you like to read? I, 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 I like, you know, I like to read all kinds of books. Uh, I like to read all kinds of books. Uh, I love reading biographies. I love reading history. So uh, I'm not sure if you read Will Durant. has a really small book called The Lessons of History, where he's taken thousands of years of history and he's condensed into 120 pages. And that's an amazing book. Um, um, less fiction, um, but all kinds, like like the Harry Potter series, and all kinds of books my son has. I mean, we discovered a book last year, which I think for entrepreneurs is really good. It's a kid's book called What Do You Do With An Idea? And um, it, it basically a story of a boy who has an idea, and the artist draws the idea like a little egg. And um, he talks about that he had this idea, and people would look at his idea and make fun of his idea, and say your idea is strange, you are weird because you have this idea. And the little boy, uh, he said, you know, when he was with his idea, he would feel great. And when he was not with his idea, he would not feel that good. And how he started nurturing it, respect what people said. And one day that little egg uh, transforms into something beautiful. And kind of the lesson of the book at the end, it's 20, 25 pages, kids picture book. Uh, it answers the question, what do you do with an idea? You change the world. Right? So what do you do with an idea? You change the world, but only you know how special your idea is, and you have to protect it from the whole world. 
right? So, like my wife started her company, it's uh, how to use machine learning and analytics to change business presentations. You know, people thought she was cuckoo because business presentations is a creative art. Can you do it through analytics? So we really had to protect that idea. A lot of people made fun of us. A lot of people said, you know, you're weird to be doing this, but you have to protect your idea, right? And what do you do with an idea? You, you change the world. If, if anyone who's ever suffered death by PowerPoint would probably disagree that <laughs> business presentations can be creative, right? So that, that's great. Yeah, exactly. And like they say, when is selling time is always selling time. So if you need presentations made for cheap, you know, here is here is, here is a good solution. And what's the name of the company? It's called Presentium, putting the Zen in presentations. Awesome. And what's the website for the folks that are, uh, are going to be watching this on the internet? Well, www.presentium.com, P-R-E-Z-E-N-T-I-U-M.com. Thank you for that question, Jay. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, and I mean, she's already got 100, 100 plus customers in six months, Fortune, all Fortune 1000 companies, so the business is doing well. We give back um, for every package we sell. We support one child uh, in an underprivileged country for a whole year, so health, education, etc. Uh, and then as we sell bigger packages, we support two to four children. So my wife and I, we supported an orphanage to grow from 40 kids to 400 kids. And we want to grow it from 400 to 1,000. So one of the reasons we're doing it is, you know, life has been great to us. We want to find a way to kind of give back. And so that's, uh, that's one of the passions we have presented. Yes, please. Uh, you're a very large guy, and um, so I have a question that's a way for the family. Uh, you know, question is for the younger generation, how do we make sure they still value kindness? And I think that's a question. Someone said, what keeps me up at night? You know, uh, my kids. How do, how, do, how do I make sure that um, uh, they grow up with, need not be our set of values, but some set of values because there's so much happening in the world. You need something that grounds you. So I'm hoping kind of, you know, if, if they have that on, it's fine. But we are trying a few things. I don't know if I have the answer, but Every July 4th weekend, uh, my son and I, we go on a, uh, we go to a different country. So um, we went to South Africa last year, we went to Belize the year before, and it's my way of showing him that, look, it's living in the Bay Area with uh, successful parents is not the only way kids live in the world, right? So we went to South Africa where the rat had depreciated significantly, right? And he saw kids his age doing different things. Uh, as part of our giving back, uh, he has a WhatsApp pal. So there is a kid his age in India who he talks to, and there's a translator because he doesn't know English. But that's one way of just getting an appreciation for the world is bigger than here. But I don't want to force any decision on him. I mean, he's going to be much smarter than I am. Right? So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I can at least give him the experiences so he can make his own, make his own decision. But it's very hard, right? Uh, it's very hard. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. One of my mentors told me that um, at work, no one cares about the input. We only care about the output. With your kids, you can only control the input. You cannot control the output, right? So we can just provide whatever input we can, right? Um, I can answer the blockchain question. Uh, one of the parts of my job is we uh, run a group called Chill. Cisco Hyper Innovation Living Labs. Uh, what we do is, um, for 48 hours, we pick a topic. Like we pick the future of oncology, cancer care. Just last month we picked uh, how do you secure the supply chain using blockchain. 
and then we get industry executives. So for the oncology one, we had Vocera, Cisco, uh, Walgreens, all, of, all the execs from, this, from these companies came. We had 50 cancer patients, so we met 50 cancer patients. We asked them questions about their lives, and we came up ideas for companies. And then we had a build team that built rapid prototypes of the products, which we tested with cancer patients for 48 hours. So we hardly slept, and we came up with six ideas, there were six groups of six ideas. Then these ideas were pitched to, a, uh, to C CFOs from these companies. And just like Shark Tank, this is the same as you with Shark Tank, uh, so I was pitching one of the ideas, and the CFOs invest money in these companies to make them real startups. So think of that as a series, as the uh, seed funding round. And then uh, Cisco would take a stake, Apple would take a stake, Walgreens would take a stake, and these, these would be companies. So it inverts the startup model, right? Because in a startup model, what happens, you have a startup, you have a founder with an idea, and then he's trying to, sh he or she is trying to shop it to big companies to, to buy in, and when they buy in, they are made, right? So you could spend a lot of time and then go meet a big company and they say, hey, this doesn't make any sense. But so what the Chill Lab does, it flips it. So the, the startup is created with big companies backing it. So all these startups created are with big company backing, and then we put an entrepreneur to lead lead the idea. So it's it's you know uh, the the lady on my team who runs it, she was profiled as the top hundred innovators in Inc, in Inc magazine, and if you it's called Chill, it's easy to remember C H I L L. There are lots of videos on the video about it. So we did one on blockchain, and. Uh, we fundamentally believe the immutable nature of the blockchain is where the value is, right? That no one can change. Uh, once it's written on the blockchain, it's written for everyone to see. So that creates that uh, it creates an immutable uh, chain of trust. And so we feel that uh, there are three sectors where the biggest opportunities are. Uh, the financial sector, which is already very crowded, right? Uh, supply chain, so we have a startup going on to verify blood diamonds. So uh, you want to know the diamond you're buying for your sweetheart, right, where did it come from? And um, it's hard to know where it is because people fudge the history. But if in the blockchain you put every step of the journey of the diamond, then you have an immutable trace and someone buying it gets a lot of value from knowing it's not a blood diamond. Uh, another area where we're investing in blockchain is in the in area of government in, um, in countries in Eastern Europe. So there are many countries that go through civil war and that go through coups. So imagine if you own a piece of land in one of these countries and you own a piece of paper that says you own this land, but a new government comes in and they say, hey, I don't trust that this is the right paper because suddenly 10 people will show up with the paper for that, for that piece of land. What if you use a blockchain solution? What if on the blockchain you said, this piece of land is owned by this particular person? So that, and again, because it's immutable, because everyone can see it, there might be many coups in the company, but you can have an external global body come and say, look, here is the proof on the blockchain. The blockchain cannot be tampered with. It's, that's why this person land, right? So we are looking at less and more bearish. I mean, it's, it's kind of like going, to, it's like going to Vegas, because no one knows what is the true value of Bitcoin, right? No one knows, and uh, there is a lot of, I, I don't know how much of it is the real value versus speculation, right? I think it went up to 5,000, now it's back to 3,000, so um, I, I don't invest in it, right? I, I have a Bitcoin wallet just to know what's happening, just keep me educated, but I would not invest in it um, because no one knows what the value is and it hasn't stood the test of time. If you're really bearish about the US dollar uh, because of all the money printing, uh, then there are other safe havens like, like I mentioned, like I'm, I'm invested in gold. What about Ethereum, which is the other? Yeah, I would say same same logic, right? I mean, Ethereum has even a shorter uh, history than uh, Bitcoin, right? And uh, it, it does does not have some of the issues of Bitcoin, but again, these have not been tested. Uh, they've not been tested over two world wars. They've not been tested over, uh, people say it cannot be hacked, but it, I mean, I think there is no. There's nothing that can't be hacked. But, so, I, so I'm saying I don't know. I think it's uh, it's hard, but I, I think I just, I just don't know. And I would not put my money in something I don't know. So I, I, I'm not investing in a big way. And doesn't doesn't mean that I'm right. It's just, it's, it's like there's so many other, the world is full of so many options, right? Why pick an option where I have no idea and I have no advantage? The reason I play poker and not play any other casino game is because I know I have an advantage in poker. Because I've studied the game, I've written software, playing online poker. Hmm. So I would never play a game where I have no edge because then I would be the sucker. 
right? And, and only with the sucker, right? So, so that's that's the blockchain gonna answer. Um, on the political regime, um, so I'm an immigrant, right? And I was reading some stats that 30% to 35% of the unicorns uh, that exist today were started by immigrants uh, to the country, and uh, I. I have a lot of love for this country. I think uh, um, you know, if you read of, I read a lot of history, and uh, America is a capitalist democracy with intellectual rights and land rights. So those are the four. It's a capitalist democracy, intellectual rights, land rights. Very few countries in the world. I, think, I don't think any company, country in the world has a combination of those four things, right? Like in India, you may own a piece of land, but someone might take it away from you. Where there are not many countries that have a combination of capitalism and democracy. Look at China, there's no democracy. Right? So I think those four things make America an amazing place. Um, and what has been very uh, reassuring to me is that the founding father, fathers have set up such a system that no one can screw it up. Even if someone tries really hard, there are lots of checks and balances to screw it up, right? So um, in terms of the policies, I and Cisco are very excited about tax repatriation, the repatriation of foreign funds, right? So Cisco has about $60 billion uh, outside America, and uh, we have one of the most archaic corporate tax systems that truly makes us uncompetitive. I think you saw this morning or yesterday morning, the tax plan was laid out for 25% for pass-through companies, undetermined amount, but a lower amount for getting the money back. I think that would be amazing, I think that would spur a new set of growth for the country. It depends if that money comes back, will that be used to buy dividends, buy back shares, or will it really be used to invest in growth? On the immigration policy, I can start it off with that. I think it would be bonkers to, um, I think America is great because the best people in the world want to come to this country and make this country greater still. And if we stop doing that, I think it's, it's, it's gonna hurt, uh, hurt everyone here. And I think we leave a country that's worse for our kids, first time in a generation, uh, than it was before. So this is my opinion. This is not. Yeah. There's no Cisco endorsement on it, right? I think uh, the more diversity, uh, the better. And you already have. We already have the right four things that no other country has. Why would you screw it up, right? Or why would you make it harder? Did I miss any? Other, any other question? You had. Sorry, what was yours? Okay, good, good, thank you. Yes, Chris. So much smaller version, you have enforcement, some changes, and innovation, whatever, in two countries, America and England. Very different cultures around failing and change and how to do stuff. There's probably been a lot of other cultures. What, yeah. what kind of interesting stories or feedback? You know, how, how are we going to get better as a, as a race at taking challenges on, failing, learning, you know, comfortable <coughs> mistakes? What, what, do you, what do you see as challenges or solutions? Yeah. Possibly funny stories from other cultures. Yeah, uh, so, so I, I think one thing for us to appreciate, which I think the East does a much better job of, is I don't think we appreciate context as much, right? Uh, we, we, we are so focused on what someone is directly saying, but we don't spend enough time thinking about what is the context of that being said. So I used to work a lot in Japan and South Korea when I was at McKinsey, and uh, in the factories in rural Japan and, uh, and in South Korea. And in Japan, I remember I went there once, and we went to a meeting, we had the meeting, we suggested the change, they said yes. I took a flight back to San Francisco, that's where we lived, and nothing happened, right? And I was like, you know, what did I do wrong? I clearly, I clearly saw the head of the factory say yes, right? And uh, what I learned was in Japan, there are three yeses. <laughs> the first yes is yes, I hear you. So uh, the second yes, is yes, I understand you. And the third yes is yes, I agree with what you are saying. Right, so I heard yes, and I directly went to the third yes, that yes, he agrees with what I'm saying. All he was saying was yes, I, I hear you, right? Your, your lips are moving, words are coming out, I, I, I hear you. This sounds yeah, a lot like marriage in many ways. Sorry? It sounds a lot like marriage in many ways. <laughs> uh, so I think that, that was one kind of funny story. And then uh, South Korea, so, um, so I had flown from San Francisco to South Korea. Again, my team was working there. And um, I, had, I had a 48-hour trip, right? I had to go in and come back because I had a client in San Jose, one in South Korea, one in Italy. 
So I was circumnavigating the globe every 10 days. Um, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I left kind of consulting, right? But anyway, but I, went, I went to South Korea and I have, okay, I have 48 hours, I have to ink this deal. And I'm sitting in, in the factory and with the corporate head from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. He doesn't say anything. And I'm like, I gotta go tomorrow, and we gotta make this deal. At uh, five ten, he comes to me, and he says, uh, "Hey, do you want to go for dinner?" I said, "Hell yeah, I want to go for dinner, right? I'm, I'm here just to talk to you." So we go for dinner, and um, there is the um, so. I just what I learned in South Korea that there is a first course, um, and there you're supposed to drink. And I'm I'm very lightweight. I stopped drinking now, but I was lightweight earlier. And they have this drink called soju in South Korea, right? So what they do is they have beer glasses, big beer glasses, and they put soju shot glasses. And they, and they hit the soju so it goes in the beer glass, then you drink the beer with the soju. And soju is very potent. I think of it as vodka plus plus, right? And um, so since I was in San Francisco and I was a consultant and he was paying me gobs of money to, so he said, let's invert it. So for first round, the big glasses were soju, <laughs> and, and the small glasses were beer, right? And I'm like, I mean, I gotta get this done, so I charged the soju, right? And then I'm like, okay, now we're gonna talk business. And uh, no, no business. And then he says, let's go to you know, round number two for eating. Then we go to round number two for eating, and then there is the uh, Korean barbecue. Right? So we go and sit, and there is very little greens, it's basically just gobs and gobs of meat, and I don't eat that much food also, right? And, and I, I don't know where this guy was putting it, he wasn't a big guy, but we had to eat so much meat. And then I'm like, okay, maybe if I eat this, we'll do the deal. And so I ate the food, and still no deal discussion. And then, because I didn't know, in Korea, there is round number three. And round number three, and this is what's crazy, is you go to a, uh, a karaoke place. So, and it's kind of bizarre, and you go to these small, there's a building, you go to these small rooms, and you go into a small room, and when you go into a small room, there is a, a, a you know, a young lady in every room who's got a mic, and um, then you go, and she will teach you how to use the mic, and then you all have to sing. And of course, it's mostly Britney Spears. Right? <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, someone told me, look, if you survive this round, Right, then the business talk is gonna happen, so I'm only inebriated, right? I have all this meat in my belly, which I, I know is gonna hurt me next day morning, right? And then, you know, I have to sing, hit me baby one more time, right? And I think I told you, I'm not, I'm not like a fun guy. And, so this, right? and, I, and, I'm, and I'm introverted, right? So I, I, this, I was like, so anyway, so I did it, right? So I did the hit me baby one more time, and then after that he sang, and I had to tell him he was, and the Koreans are great singers, because they've been training, yeah. Uh, since they were kids, right? So they're, and they, they sing all these songs of the 80s and 90s. So anyways, after those three rounds, Chris, he was willing to discuss the deal. And uh, so we did it, we, we kind of made the deal. But my point is, I mean, this is all context, right? I'm gonna simplify, this is all context. But in, in America, we are so busy running and getting one things done, and we are so direct, right? I think sometimes as a country, we have to get better. Uh, I think we have to understand context and just be more sensitive to there are many ways to win, right? And I mean, China's, China's doing amazing things and you know, they're not doing zero to one, they're doing one to end. They're not creating new things, they're commercializing, globalizing. But we have to be respectful that there are different ways to win and, and learn from them. So hopefully that, I, hopefully that gives you the funny story and, the, and, and what America can do. Yeah. I don't think we're gonna do any better of a question starting now. So it's probably a, a good note to start to wind down on. Uh, going back to your practice that I would love to honor here, uh, we were chatting earlier tonight with Debbie and some other folks about just everything that's going on in the world right now and, and world disasters and things of that nature. And so I'd love to give a quick pause before we wrap up and just kind of reflect on whatever you're most grateful for uh, at this point in time that we all have. Quick, quick moment on that. And with that, we'd love to offer huge gratitude from all of us, for you, your wife, and your son, for making it so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.